One of my favorite stories, and some of you have heard this one, is about the story of the father at the grocery store. And in his cart, with him in the grocery store, is a three-year-old, three-year-old little boy. His three-year-old little boy, who is uncontrollable, pitching a fit. And as his dad is pushing him up and down the aisles of the grocery store, you hear him say, calm down, Billy. We can do this, Billy. It's just a little longer, Billy. We'll be in the car in five minutes, Billy. We'll be home and see Mom in 15 minutes. Billy, we can do this. Billy, be a good boy. There was another shopper, an older woman who had noticed, and as he was checking out, she sympathetically put her hand on his shoulder and said, I just have to tell you that I am so impressed with how patient you are with your son, Billy. It is so amazing. And the dad said, His name is Wesley. I'm Billy. (laughs) No matter how much you love someone, there are times when your love is going to be stretched. There are times when you are going to have to go to a next level love. We're in a series entitled Love Like Jesus, and the key text for this series is John chapter 13, beginning in verse 34. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's a whole nother level of love. Why did Jesus insist that a love like his would be the identifying mark for those who followed him? I think it's because so much of the love that we experience in this world is superficial love. A love like his stands out. In a world like ours, because it's a love without qualifiers. We talked about this last week. It is an unconditional love. It is an in spite of love and not a because of love. And so we have no greater mission as God's people than to love like Jesus because that's the leverage that we have in the world. Loving like Jesus, loving as he loved, job one. It's not optional. It's a command. Here's the way the Apostle Paul put it when he was writing to the Thessalonian church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning verse 9. Paul says, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. What's Paul saying here? He's saying that followers of Jesus are always trying to take their love for one another to the next level. In other words, when it comes to loving one another, we are never to become comfortable with the level that we're at. We're never to settle for static love. Part of the reason is because, you see, nobody in the world should do loving better than the followers of Jesus. We ought to be the best at loving people of any group in the world. In fact, according to Paul, nobody should be able to teach us about loving each other. Look at verse 9 again. First Thessalonians 4, verse 9. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. Paul says, hey, we've been taught by God to love each other, which begs the question, how? How has God taught us to love each other? Well, first, the first way is through Jesus. Jesus was love made flesh. If you ever want to know what love looks like, All you have to do is take a look at Jesus. We don't need anybody else to teach us about love because we have have the greatest example of love that lived among us. Another way God has taught us to love is by the indwelling of his spirit, filling us with his love. Romans 5 and verse 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, you can't love like Jesus without his Holy Spirit empowering you to love like Jesus. In other words, you can't love like Jesus by just gritting your teeth and willing yourself to do it. God pours his love into our heart through the Holy Spirit so that when you're hurt and your instinct says retaliate, hit them harder than you hit you, then the Spirit whom we're learning to listen to whispers, no, turn the other cheek. And when our instinct is to curse those who curse us, the spirit within you says, no, no, no. This is your moment to bless. You see, God is love. And the Bible says that we have become partakers. Peter talks about this. We have become partakers, partakers of the divine nature. Now, what does that mean, partakers of the divine nature? That means as a Christian, 
You have a higher capacity to love people than anyone else in the world because you are partakers of the divine nature because God's spirit lives in you. You have the capacity to love others like Jesus. No other group in the world has the capacity to excel at loving more than you do, God says, because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. But here's the thing. While Christ commands you to love, he will not coerce you to love. While the Holy Spirit can enable you to love, he will not compel you to love. And the point is this. Loving like Jesus requires a decision. That love is not a feeling. Love is a decision. That's why you have passages like Colossians 3 and verse 14. And over all these virtues, put on love. Notice that requires a decision. Or 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, follow the way of love. Notice that is a choice. It is a decision. To love like Jesus means that you put your convictions over your feelings. Now, the love that's promoted in our culture, in our songs, in our movies, in popular culture is about feeling. It is about falling in love. You know this, right? It's like you're walking along, minding your own business, and suddenly you accidentally, unintentionally stumble and fall into love love and it's so amazing and it's just uncontrollable love just happens but here's the problem if love is uncontrollable if it is a feeling and emotion a biochemical reaction that just happens to you then falling in and out of love is not your fault you have no control over it I've had couples sit across from me in my office and tell me they wanted to end their marriage because they just don't love each other anymore. I just don't love them anymore. I would ask, did you, did you ever love them? They say, yeah, but I just don't feel that way about them anymore. They might say, listen, I love them, but I'm not in love with them. You ever heard that? And I say, well, what, what does that mean? They say, well, you know, I wish them well. I care for them, but I just don't have the same feelings that I once had for them. Listen, if love is simply a feeling, a biochemical reaction to stimuli that we cannot control, then you can't, help it, you can't be held accountable for the ending of a relationship. No one can. It means that when God commands husbands, Colossians 3 and verse 19, to love their wives, he's asking you to do something you can't control. You can't control, can't command an emotion, a feeling. But listen, love is not first and foremost a feeling. It may at times create feelings, but love, according to the Bible, is a decision. Love is an action. That's why God can command love. That's why he can command you to love your enemies. You know he's not commanding you to have the warm fuzzies. When you see someone who, wants to, who wishes you harm, he's commanded you to act, to behave a certain way despite your feelings. Romans 12 and verse 20, it's not on the overhead. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. So when a man or a woman tells me that they've, they've lost that love and feeling, if you'll pardon me borrowing from that song, I, I am sometimes just not a good counselor because I tell them to stop feeling and start doing. Saying, I just don't love them anymore is a cowardly way to escape your responsibility as a follower of Jesus. Now you might say, wait, wait just a minute. If I act loving when I don't feel like it, won't that make me a hypocrite? God didn't want anybody to be a hypocrite. No, no, no. A hypocrite is a person who pretends to be something they have no intention of becoming. You're not a hypocrite when you act like the person you want to be, even when you don't feel like it in the moment, like being that person. Now, to illustrate this, if you have young children, if, if you've had young children, you know what it's like to wake up at 2 a.m. because they're crying. It hadn't been so long ago that I, I can remember that. You're, you, know, you hear them crying in the other room. I don't feel like dealing with it. I don't feel like getting out of this warm bed. But what does love require, right? So I roll over and say, Lane, get up and take care of the kids. <laughs> I care, I care that much. I care that much. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like the story of the teacher trying to explain fractions to her class. 
She says, she says to little Jimmy, okay, there's six people in your family. Your mother makes a pie, and she cuts up the pie. What percentage of the pie would you get? Little Jimmy says one-fifth. They just, no, no, no. There's six people in your family. What percentage would you get? Again, little Jimmy says, I'd get one-fifth. And she says, Jimmy, I'm afraid you don't understand fractions. And Jimmy says, no, teacher, you don't understand my mama. She would say she doesn't want any. You see, that's what love constantly does. It wills to do what love requires, sometimes despite our feelings. Jesus did not go to the cross because he felt like it. He went to, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, makes that very clear. He didn't go to the cross because he felt like it. He chose to go because it was the will of his Father. It was the will of the one that he loved. You see, you can never love like Jesus until you understand that love is a decision, until you decide to love. Notice 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 again. I love how the message paraphrases this. The message says, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it, because it does. I like that paraphrase, go after a life of love. Because loving like Jesus requires a decision. It requires a commitment. Superficial love makes relationship like everything else in our culture disposable. But if you're going to love like Jesus, that means loving over the long haul. It means loving over the long term. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Or 1 John 4 verse 16. God is love. If we keep on loving others, we will stay one in our hearts with God, and he will stay one with us. See, when Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, He's really calling us to a supernatural love that never gives up, that's in it for the long haul. Years ago, Max Lucado, in one of his books, tells a story about involving one of the members of the church where he preaches, a guy by the name of David Robinson. And some of you, if you're fans of professional basketball, you might recognize that name. Remember, he was a star in the NBA. Uh, his team, the San Antonio Spurs, won several championships. He was even the MVP of the league one year, just a great basketball player. But I don't know if you knew this, but he is also your brother in Christ, a very dedicated Christian. And many years ago, on the 10th anniversary, 10th wedding anniversary, he asked Max Lucado to renew the marriage vows between he and his wife. And so he paid to fly Max and his wife, along with some of his teammates, all the way to Hawaii for a ceremony on the beach. By the way, let me go on record right now. If any of you need to do that, I'm <laughs> happy to. I'll sacrifice, all right? I'll sacrifice if you want to do that. <laughs> so, they're, so they're on the beach. Max is performing the ceremony, and David and his wife, Valerie, they're renewing their vows, and his teammates are watching this. It's just a beautiful ceremony, Max says. But then David gets down on his knees, and he looks at his three boys, David Jr., Corey, and Justin. And he says this, I want you to know that I will never leave your mother. I want you to know that you will always have a daddy. Some of you had a father or mother like that, didn't you? Somebody was in it for the long haul. To love like Jesus is to be committed for the long haul. To never give up. That's why it's worth saying again, you can't do this by sheer willpower. You must choose to be this kind of person, yes, but you can only do it by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. So while love is a choice, it's also a fruit. Loving like Jesus is a fruit. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, which is why every day in your walk with God, you say, Lord, I'm yours today. Lord, take me. Take my heart. Make me like Jesus let me walk in your spirit and your power today. And when you do that, the Lord starts to do a work in you. He starts to transform that stubborn character that most of us have. Suddenly fruit like gentleness and patience and goodness and kindness starts to form in our lives. It's very important to see how this spirit does this work. By the way, not only individually, but he does this work in the community that we call the church. One of the reasons why church is so important is this is the perfect context for you to learn to love like Jesus. In this church, we have so many examples of what it looks like to love like Jesus. We were talking about that earlier, weren't we? 
Couples who are in it for the long haul. Longtime followers of Jesus who inspire us to love like Jesus. And I have to add this. In addition to that, in every church, there are people who will just drive you nuts. And who will give you the opportunity to grow and to practice loving like Jesus. I mean, think about that. Often, the last thing really you need to do sometimes when you get frustrated is just to, to pick up from this church, just to leave and take your, take your ball and go home and find a new church. How in the world can you learn to love like Jesus if you don't have people in your life that require you to really practice giving grace to? It's like the story I heard of the minister had had his first Sunday in a new church, and he decided he was going to do a children's sermon that first Sunday he brought all the kids up on stage, and in this particular auditorium, there was a beautiful stained glass window of great scenes from Scripture. And so he decided to make a point to the kids by using that stained glass window. And pointing to the windows, here's what he said. He said to the children, look at those beautiful windows. Even though it's just one scene, each window is made up of many, many small panes of glass. And it takes many panes of glass to tell one story. And that's true in a church. So he looked at these kids and he says, I want you to understand that you are a little pain. And you are a little pain. And you are a little pain. And he couldn't understand why everybody was laughing, but the truth of the matter is, he was telling the truth of the matter, right? Church is full of little people, of people rather, who are a little pain. Some of them not so little, right? In fact, one of the surest signs that a church is loving like Jesus is that it's going to attract people who need extra grace. It's going to attract people who don't have it all together. It's going to attract difficult people. Don't run from a church like that. Instead, welcome the opportunity God is giving you to learn to love like Jesus. Because how are you going to grow to love like Jesus if you constantly avoid difficult people? It's not going to happen. By the way, remember that God didn't find any of us easy to love either. Romans 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us not because we're easy to love, but in spite of the fact that we can be very incredibly difficult to deal with. If you love like Jesus, if you love the way Jesus loved, you're going to love difficult people. You're going to love people with all of their uh, idiosyncrasies, despite the irritations that other people can create from. In fact, if you are going to love like Jesus, you've got to love to learn to express kindness even when you're wronged, even when you are insulted. In fact, that, maybe that more than any other thing will show the world the love of Jesus. Nothing distinguishes loving like Jesus more than returning a hurt with kindness. There is no other way that distinguishes the love of the flesh and the love of the spirit than our response to hostile people, Right? And it's like the couple, I just saw this story last week about the couple in bed and the neighbor's dog was in the backyard barking all night. And the neighbor's dog had been doing this for a while and finally the man throws back the covers and he says, I've had enough of this. I can't take this anymore. Not the first time it's happened. So he gets up and he marches down the stairs and she, his wife, hears him slam the door. About five minutes later, he comes back in the house and gets in bed and the dog is still barking. And his wife says, "Hun." What did you do? And he says, so I got that dog and I put him in our backyard. Let's see how they like it. <laughs> that, is, that is the response of the flesh sometimes to people who upset us. By the way, the irony is, is that when we take it to the next level, all we're doing is continuing the tit for tat. We're escalating the situation, the, the deepening the divides. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 15 says, Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. In other words, nothing says loving like Jesus as when you respond to a wrong and how you respond to a wrong that's done to you. Uh, Wade Boggs is a Hall of Fame baseball player, 
For y'all who are baseball fans, you know that. He began his career with the Boston Red Sox. He hated to play in Yankee Stadium, and one of the reasons was because of the fans. In fact, there was one particular fan that would come to the game every week, sit close to third base as he could, and just give, just give Wade Boggs a hard time. He would wear him out with obscenities, with insults. And so one day, Boggs is there warming up, and the guy starts in. And Boggs, walk, Boggs walks over to the wall, and he says to him, are you the guy that's always screaming and cursing at me? And the guy stands up, and he says, well, yes, I am. And what are you going to do about it? Wade Boggs pulls out a brand-new baseball. He autographs it and tosses it to him and walked away. And he said the man never yelled at him again. <laughs> now, be honest. There is somebody in your past who's hurt you, and you've let your love level for them get static. It hasn't risen. I mean, every time you think about them, that, that wound reminds you of what they did. You're still holding some level of animosity, and it's, it's gonna, you're going to need supernatural help to help you love like Jesus, like Jesus loved you. It's going to take God's love being poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. See, when Jesus says, you love one another the way I have loved you, he's asking us to raise the bar, to love those who are hurting and to love those who have hurt you, to love even the difficult, irritating people in your life or in the church. But we can't love like this until we're convinced that it's God doing the loving. God will never command you to do something without empowering you to do it. First, I think if you're going to do it, it requires two things. First, we talked about this last week. It requires believing that God absolutely, unconditionally loves you. That God loves you more than anything you could ever imagine. But number two, I think it requires surrendering to the only source of unlimited love. Yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12, and I want to end with this passage. It says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. I want to say it one more time. As followers of Jesus, as temples of the Holy Spirit, you have the capacity to love better than any people group on planet Earth. And God will help you become who is your new nature, who's been given you the capacity to be, because Jesus will not ask us to do the impossible, and he's asked us to love the way that he has loved. How did Jesus love? He loved you all the way to the cross. All the way to the cross. And he turns and he says, follow me. Will you love like Jesus? Will you follow him? We're going to offer the invitation. Our shepherds will be at the back if you want to pray with them one-on-one. -on -one. Any requests that you have, they'd love to pray with you. If you want to be baptized into Christ, become a follower of his this morning. The water's ready. Whatever you need, let's stand and sing.